Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I have to say it's uh, quite a disconcerting um, situation I find myself in this morning. Not only am I addressing 550 people, but it's not often that when I speak uh, that it's other people who are using the words tax and fiscal regime and allowances. And uh, um, I'll have to find some new ground to speak about, and I'll duly endeavor to do that. Um, thanks to James um, and Mike for their pre excellent presentations. Uh, thanks for that introduction, Malcolm. Uh, what I did want to talk about were just a, a number of other issues affecting the industry directly and indirectly feeding into the feedback and output from the activity survey, but which are in, in part impacting businesses more generally. To this end, I'm going to talk about three topics. Uh, I'm going to look at the general economic conditions affecting UK business, implications for financial markets, and how that, that's affecting this industry. Uh, I'll say just a little bit more about decommissioning and the fiscal um, changes that we'd like to see coming up with the budget on the 21st of March. Uh, these topics go a little way to explaining the uh, subtitle for this presentation. Uh, crosswinds, insofar as certain factors have the potential for blowing us off course. Other issues are very much targets for the future well-being of the industry, and these are in the crosshairs of our rifle sites and crossroads, because as always seems to be the case, the decisions around some of these big issues and the conditions which affect the industry will have a significant bearing on the sort of future the industry has and the direction of travel. Time is short for me this morning, therefore um, this will be a little bit of a whistle-stop tour, and with something of an apology, I have to let you know that I've had to drop all humorous material from today's presentation. Um, that didn't actually take too long to affect. So please bear with me as I crack on. Uh, I'd like to start, as I said, by taking a look at general economic conditions. Uh, those of you who, who know me uh, know I'm no economist, but I do think it's beholding on all of us uh, to have a keen interest in and perspective on the bigger picture out there as we consider uh, the implications for the industry and also for our own businesses. To help me with that, I'm going to refer to the Deloitte CFO survey, which, uh, strangely enough, is a survey of the UK's uh, CFOs and group finance directors of listed large private companies and UK subsidiaries of major overseas companies. And I'm delighted to say that uh, many contributors to that survey are actually in the audience today. We've been carrying out this temperature check for the last 18 quarters and the data that I'm going to refer to is taken from our Q4 2011 results published last month. This material is also used by the Bank of England in setting policy. This first slide looks at how expectations for growth have moved over the last 12 months across a number of major economies. Even if you can't make out all the detail, we all know that graphs that run in this direction are not good. Uh, I'm sure none of that necessarily comes as a surprise, though perhaps the pickup through the last two or three months of the year in the US and continuing good US consumer data through January is a cause for a bit of optimism. With regard to the UK, I think it's worth noting that it enjoys one of the steepest uninterrupted fall-offs in consensus expectations since late summer last year. So what do UK CFOs tell us about the current climate? Well, the biggest concern for them in 2012 is the risk of the breakup of the euro. 37% consider, consider it to be probable that one or more members of the single currency will leave the euro in 2012. They're pricing in a UK recession and expect the economy to remain weak for a prolonged period. The slide shows the makeup of the other pressures that CFOs feel they're operating under. And, somewhat, and while some of those are quite obvious, I did think it was interesting that the ill-defined segment of uncertainty was one which featured. 56% of CFOs rate the level of uncertainty facing their business as being high or very high. A quote from one of the respondents was that everyone is waiting for something very bad to happen. I'm going to talk a little bit later about access to finance within the UK and for the industry, and there's no doubt that uncertainty and these other factors are having a bearing. Only 13% believe that this would be a good time to take on additional risk onto their balance sheets, and that's down from over 40% only 12 months ago. CFOs believe that the collapse of the euro would have its most severe effects on UK business through financial channels because of a new credit crunch, and this would drive major swings in asset prices and exchange rates. These conclusions lend themselves to the sort of headlines that we've all seen over the last year or two. 
The key focus for CFOs in 2012 is to strengthen their balance sheets, reduce costs, increase cash flow. The probability assigned to the likelihood of a double dip, as you can see from the slide, is clearly on the increase. I'm putting all those aspects together. Perhaps most of all, the survey demonstrates how external risk blunts corporate ambitions for expansion. By and large, big corporates in the UK, Euro area and the US have the firepower to spend. Significant amounts of cash are sitting on their balance sheets. The challenge for policymakers in 2012 is to convince them that it makes good business sense to spend it. Turning specifically to financing, it's fair to say that all this financial stress has made CFA, CFOs more wary of all three main forms of external finance. Bond issuance and bank borrowing remain the most favoured forms, but are less so than at any time in the last year. Equity issuance is firmly out of favour with CFOs. It's less popular today than in early 2009, when the FTSE 100 was close to 3,500. Last night it closed at 5,915. And consistent with that view of bank borrowing, this next slide shows the increase in the percentage of CFOs that credit, recording that credit is costly, and a decreasing percentage saying that credit is easily available. So that's the overall view, and somewhat depressing view, of this latest snapshot of CFOs' attitudes. Now I strongly suspect the reaction of many in this audience will be a resigned, tell me something I don't know. But hopefully that provides a bit of context to the specific circumstances within which our industry operates and from which, like it or not, we're not immune and which all businesses need to adjust to and work through. With that in mind, let me just say a few further comments regarding access to finance. This is a complex and fluid situation. Therefore, in the time available, it will be an overview, just giving a directional sense of where we are and where we might be headed. So in line with the general picture, capital markets can be very difficult to access. The use of AIM, for example, is significantly restricted from where we were a few years ago. The European IPO pipeline, particularly targeting the middle of 2012, is building. But especially if oil prices remain at current levels and investor confidence improves, is probably overstretched relative to the likely funding availability. The market is very finely balanced. Companies need to be well prepared to access this potential market window, but also pragmatic in anticipating that not everyone will secure the requisite funding. The debt markets are also affected by many competing pressures. The banks are open for lending, but to some extent this needs to be safe lending. They're faced with additional constraints, capital requirements, regulatory pressures, higher interbank costs of money, shorter time horizons all against the backdrop of the economic issues we've talked about, resulting in ever more risk analysis of lending opportunities and more conservative assumptions, for instance, on price deck. That said, the sense is that the oil and gas sector, generally, is viewed more favorably than others. The funders are being selective. We've seen a flight to perceived quality. Size matters, diversification matters, management quality matters. We've seen a change in the names and numbers of players actively seeking business in this market, but the market remains very competitive for the right sort of deal. We're also seeing an increased focus on the return on the bank's equity and more weight given to non-debt income streams. The banks want to see what additional revenue can be generated from deposit income, money transactions, hedging, letters of credit, and possibly through a capital transaction in due course. Management need to, be very, they need to have a very clear story of the opportunity and be able to articulate sensitivities and clear upside. And as for future trends, with equity markets tightening in Europe and globally through 2011 and debt available only on conservative terms, access to capital, especially for development projects and to meet work commitments, is difficult. Therefore, I expect to see further consolidation, the arrival of new entrants and increased M&A activity generally. As regards m and specific to the oil field services sector, transactions are being targeted at securing strategic positions relating to global opportunities, deals which allow for global skills, 
technologies and products to be leveraged into new markets or provide for access to new international customers. Order books have started to grow and this is underpinning valuation expectations for potential sellers. We also expect to see an increased interest from private equity. An interesting and important footnote to the picture around upstream M&A is the increasing role and activity levels of companies with accumulated tax losses. With the increase of the tax rate last year, not only are these losses of greater value to the business itself, their ability to shelter future income arising from target assets is having a bearing on bid valuations. So, increasing, so an increasing frequency of asset swaps, farm outs, private placements, and given the above constraints, especially at the smaller end of the market, a need on the parts of both funders and businesses, both upstream and service sector, to innovate to find some new models of funding and ways to de-risk. Let me now turn to decommissioning, um, which has been referred to by Mike uh, earlier. Uh, a subject that's never been off the agenda, but certainly over the last few years has taken on increasing importance as we consider how UKCS's potential can be optimized over the coming decades. A lot of work has gone on, got into this um, particular area over the last 12 months. Uh, Oil and Gas UK, as Mike had identified, um, can point to an additional 1.7 billion barrels uh, that will be available over time. Uh, the subject has seen intense activity over the last 12 months, and I, I, like others, acknowledge the work of the industry, Oil and Gas UK, professional services firms, DEC, Treasury, HMRC, in taking forward this discussion of what is a key issue and one which also has a major bearing on financial capacity. Firstly, a quick reminder of the scale envisaged. Over the next 30 years, it's 500 platforms, uh, 8,000 wells, 4 million tons of steel, several hundred subsea wells, manifolds, pipelines needing to be decommissioned. Work undertaken by, Delo by Deloitte's Petroleum Services Group and Douglas Westwood supports Oil and Gases UK estimates that the cost should be in the region of 40 to 50 billion dollars. That's a big spend and a lot of related tax relief. And it's the tax relief angle that clearly is the subject of attention at the moment. As we saw from last year, the government has the ability to unilaterally change the regime, which has definitely given rise to considerable uncertainty as, the, as to the rate of relief that decommissioning costs will attract in the future. The uh, Treasury Tax Group that was formed by Oil and Gas UK, the first task was to identify whether this uncertainty around financial, fiscal treatment of decommission is restricting investment and hence the development of reserves. Some of that's been touched on already, but very quickly, it does feed into businesses' um, borrowing capacity insofar as letter of credits are required to be posted. In addition, there's clear evidence that existing owners are factoring decommissioning uncertainty and tax relief thereon into appraisal projects for investment and providing infrastructure access, making the economics more marginal and in some cases projects non-viable. And it's also worth noting that uncertainty over decommissioning relief is unique when compared with our North Sea neighbours. This prevailing fiscal uncertainty means that investors include a higher risk premium when assessing commercial opportunities on the UKCS. And whilst the govern government is committed not to reduce the availability of relief further, this commitment holds only for the life of this parliament, whereas the vast majority of decommission clearly will be undertaken over a much longer time frame. The solution Mike referred to, uh, deed of assurance, is the output from these intense conversations which have taken place over the last several months. I won't go back over that ground, but uh, suffice to say that, and I'll spare you all the detail, but the proposal as it currently stands, does seek to address the thorny issues of companies who eventually incur decommissioning expenditure but have insufficient historical tax capacity to take that relief, the need to bind future governments, and it is hoped that such a solution will also provide sufficient certainty to allow the funding requirement to move on to a post-tax basis and bring clarity to exactly what expenditure is covered by the relief. As has already been said, discussions continue and we await the budget with interest keen interest. 
Again, I won't repeat what uh, earlier speakers have, have talked about. There clearly is a wish list for the budget 2012. Again, an immense amount of work has gone into evidencing why this specific targeting of allowances and field allowances uh, is a net win for, for everyone, including the Exchequer. And again, we await the, uh, the outcome of the budget. I think expectations that everything can be delivered in one fell swoop are perhaps a little optimistic notwithstanding how critical all these changes could be. Um, but who knows, perhaps the oil and gas UK banner at Pataudry a few weeks ago proclaiming, we love HMRC, will do the trick. A <laughs> uh, couple of other sub points really. Um, we already know that with effect from 1 January this year, the uh, ring fence exploration, ex uh, exploration supplement uh, has been increased from 6 to 10%. That's very welcome. And there's also ongoing dialogue regarding the interaction of uh, supplementary corporate tax rates with capital gains, and we hope for a good outcome to those discussions. Ladies and gentlemen, other issues of the day we will need to leave for another time. I'm going to say no more on that. And so back to my opening theme. There are clearly a number of crosswinds affecting the general economy, the industry, and UK CS at the moment. The industry has set about making sure that the most critical issues are squarely in the crosshairs of the rifle sites, and the route we go down at this particular crossroads will have a major bearing on the success, longevity and contribution of the UKCS to the rest of the UK going forward. And just a final word, despite all these challenges and the hard decisions we face, and given the rather bleak headlines, analysis and forecasts which are around, there's no other industry personally I would rather be involved with. And there are very few other parts of the UK, I think, have as much potential. It will, though, take all stakeholders to realise it. Thank you very much.